Hello? Hello? Hello, everyone. <coughs> Thank you all for being here with us. We're going to start the second part of this program of tonight, um, which is a Q&A um, with Grada Quilomba. I will introduce her, and then we will go into a few questions, and then I will open up to the audience. So you can also participate and ask questions if you have any. So um, this project um, came into being through an invitation by Wendelin van Oldenburg, who's doing the Cinema Olanda project. And um, we, from First Things First, uh, decided to invite Grada Quilomba, since her work has been very inspiring to us um, in the past two years. And we really wanted uh, to invite her in the Netherlands because it's the first time also that you're here in the Netherlands uh, performing second. the second. Okay. Um, yeah, so we really wanted to also meet you and this was a good opportunity to meet you and uh, be more in dialogue with your work and with yourself. Um, so Grada is um, an interdisciplinary artist and writer and um, her work draws uh, on memory, trauma, race, gender um, and the decolonization of knowledge and narrative and the most important questions in her work um, are who can speak, uh, what can we speak about, and what happens when we speak. Um, her oeuvre consists of uh, different formats and registers, such as publications, uh, stage readings, performances, video installation, and theoretical text, um, creating a hybrid space between academic knowledge and artistic practice. And uh, in her practice, storytelling is central, as you have all uh, witness tonight. Um, well, she is, uh, uh, in 2011, she was awarded one of the most uh, inspirational black women in Europe, uh, by the black woman in Europe, uh, and um, in 2013, she was named a woman of excellence by some magazine, and since 2017, Grada is Presented, represented by the Goodman Gallery in Johannesburg in South Africa. And um, Illusions, which we just saw, is um, a work that was commissioned by the 32nd Biennial of uh, Sao Paulo, for which Grada um, made two projects. One is the Desire Project, uh, which is a video installation divided into three parts, While I Walk, While I Write, uh, While I Speak, While I Write, While I Walk and illusions, and um, well, tonight we witnessed illusions, and um, yeah, we're going into, um, yeah, talking together now. Uh, so, Grada, you have an academic background uh, with degrees in psychoanalysis and a PhD in philosophy, and you have thought for 14, over 14 years, uh, amongst others, at the Humboldt University, where your classes um, on decolonizing knowledge uh, have become, um, yeah, a huge part, an inspirational part for black and POC students and part of the decolonization movement, which is also going on in Germany. Um, but in the past years, you have left the academia and you have chosen to work more in the art context, as I understood, and I'm interested to learn when you decided to transition to a more art-based practice and why and how? Um, well, actually, thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me here. It's really lovely to be here. Um, uh, it means like um, a lot of sense to be here today um, because of all the discussion about the name of this institution. And it was very interesting because I was uh, in the performance and I felt like uh, in each space it has a new meaning and in this space it has a new meaning and it, it, it felt like the performance was speaking to the physical building itself and that was very inspiring for me. And I think maybe for this reason I left, 
I didn't leave academia. I think I was always this kind of hybrid person who was always transgressing fields and disciplines and um, was always out of place everywhere somehow. And I've been crossing these different fields and um, it's not that I finished one and started a new one. I worked first a lot. My background, I started by studying clinical psychology and psychoanalysis and back then I worked a lot with war survivors in Lisbon during the time of war in Angola and Mozambique. So uh, from there I started writing a lot and uh, I was very interested on on documenting histories and subjectivi uh, subjectivities and narratives and psychoanalysis were, was really powerful because it works with the unconscious and with metaphors and symbols. So it could give me a lot of symbology and metaphorical uh, uh, material to work on histor stories that were silent. And from there, I became very interested on bringing these stories into performance. I was very concerned with uh, knowledge, uh, which knowledge do we uh, produce and how do we produce knowledge and how can I bring this knowledge into performance and make it vivid and make it felt in the body and in the emotions to bring all these different layers of knowledge production that usually is not there. In the academia, we, um, there's this very long old colonial tradition of creating an object uh, that you observe from the distance, uh, you s describe and classify and speak about and, and you are supposed to be a disembodied theorist and artist that's why we enter these spaces and we only have ads without bodies, as you have noticed, usually of white men uh, with neck and 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 uh, and, uh, and the head, which is so symbolic of what knowledge means, is something cognitive that stays here. It's not related to the body or to the heart or to the to the belly. Um, you are supposed to create others, an object that you should never be in relation with. So knowing that most of the disciplines function with this, uh, with this dynamic um, and that this dynamic is strongly connected with the colonial and patriarchal discourse, of course, when we come to speak and to produce knowledge, of course, uh, you have to transgress those disciplines and you have to transgress these methodologies. You cannot work with those disciplines that placed you as the other, that have described you, that have spoke about you. So we come with all this subjectivity and emotionality and physicality and memory and spirituality and so on. So I, I, I became very interested in bringing um, part of political and theoretical texts into performance. Uh, there was a period I worked a lot uh, in the theater and uh, brought things into stage and I usually work with an ensemble of actors that you saw in this film. Um, we are about five, six actors that I always work with. They are all um, German actors of color, Afro-German and um, work usually in the National Theatre or uh, dancers, and they are really, really good. And we, I, I formed this little small group that I always worked with in all different projects. And um, I feel more that I, I left more uh, the academia and I went more into the arts because um, I felt very, incomplete. Um, I, uh, I felt that um, I wanted to work more in a field that is open enough to, exp to be experimental. And in the academia we cannot be very experimental. In theatre also not so much. It's very traditional, it's extremely conservative as well, extremely racist, like the academia itself. And like in the contemporary arts itself. It's not different, but the difference is that in contemporary art, I think 
there's a space to raise questions uh, while in other spaces you are supposed to give answers. And I find that very much more fascinating to create works where um, after people seeing the work, they leave with new questions. So you produce knowledge by producing questions instead of giving answers. And I find that very fascinating to, um, to work more metaphorically and to reach I find it also more transformative somehow. So this is this has been a long path. I think after working on stage and staging a lot of things, then I got more and more interested in visualizing, visualizing um, the stories, and also visualizing um, texts. That's, for instance, what is the desire project is. So. Um, but I think most of all I'm interested on in telling stories and I'm mostly interested on experimenting. And I think we have a lot of experimental work to do because, uh, because we have to transgress these borders in this discipline. So I think we are a generation of artists who are searching for a language. I th when I look back to my work, I think each project is a different format and a different language, and I like that. Um, I'm not particularly interested on being a, a filmmaker or a performer or a writer. Or I want to tell stories and and work with the different disciplines and f create a format that fits to me to m or to that story somehow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the very clear explanation. And I also noticed next to text and visuals, you also make use of music in your work. Um, a recurrent theme was, I put a spell on you, which in the end you understand is white supremacy has put a spell on you. And <laughs> so this, yeah, on all of us. On all of us. On, uh, yeah, and yeah. I was wondering what is the role of music because it's so, in its different layers, it becomes so explicit towards uh, the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I put a spell on you. I chose the music. I was very in love with the music. Um, I love the work of both uh, Aquins and and also of Nina Simon. And I was searching for all variations of I put a spell on you to use them in different moments. And I thought that was very adequate to the point to this uh, to this uh, performance as we are all put under the spell of white supremacy, but all of us. And, uh, and she plays with that quite well. I put a spell on you and you are mine. It doesn't matter what you want, I put a spell on you. And um, I, li I like to work with these contradictions because the film, as you notice, is a silent film. And I chose not to have um, any sound besides the besides the music yeah. and the beats, which is also music. And on the contrary to, for instance, the Desire Project, um, which has no voiceover, but only music. And uh, maybe I can explain why. Uh, with Illusions, I wanted really to recreate a kind of storytelling. Um, in the last years, I've bec I became very fascinated with this African tradition of storytelling and the oral tradition as a way of producing knowledge in counterpart to the usual forms of knowledge production that we have in, in the Western um, structures, which always involve a storytelling, a body who tells the story, a drumming, the music. It involves a whole, a whole setting, a mise-en-scene, that is very spiritual and is very linked with the ancestors, with the past, with the present, with the future. I, I find that very, very fascinating to create knowledge through this storytelling. So I wanted to kind of tell a story that we all know, but sometimes we don't know why we know it. And to bring a new meaning or a new reading after staging it, uh, what is in that story, in that myth of Narcissus and Echo? What is this love story and what could represent? And it has many different layers. 
and the layer of colonialism is also there. This fascination with itself and the reproduction of its own image and this consensus of uh, speak of loyalty that Echo has towards Narcissus, even though she's not loved by Narcissus, but she remains loyal and she does not want to know. And I find that 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 um, the, those different layers of gender and, and sexuality and race were very fascinating to transport into a post-colonial society. And I thought to tell this story um, and to come as a voice, as a storyteller, like a, a, a modern, a contemporary griot who tells the story so everybody here and this time we can hear the story that we know in a different way. And the projection of the silent film would be a little bit like um, the visualization of the words of the storyteller. Uh, like a dream, music is very important. Um, and for instance, in the Desire project, that is a, a three, ch a three uh, video installation, a three uh, act a video installation simultaneously, I decided to subvert in a different way um, to do a video installation without any image besides the words itself so that the message becomes prominent, that the audience has to read what I want to tell. It's about coming to voice. And instead of having a voiceover, uh, I only worked, I worked with Moses Leo again, and he did the um, drumming uh, we were researching a lot, and he did the drumming to the to the to the videos, and I I don't know we composed that it took weeks and weeks until he composed that music, and once we had the music, I rewrote the text according to the music, and I re-edited the films I I don't know countless times until the words fit physically like a breathing body with the music. So it's like the music is the voice and the words is the body. And I wanted to work with that um, for a very political reason. I think music comes especially for the African diaspora, a diaspora but for many other diasporas, it become, music really has this element of political resistance because we have been entering many spaces through music. We have been denied entrance into many different spaces, but music is something metaphysical that you can maybe um, deny entrance to uh, someone, but once that person is outside playing the music, it enters that space anyway, because you cannot filter music. If I say that a group of people or community cannot enter here, if they stay outside and they play the music, I have to hear the music. Music has this force of, filter, it, 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 of entering spaces and you cannot filter. And, um, and this is a long historical tradition uh, that black people have been occupying many spaces through music. Actually, also as musicians only. Um, not as, art, as, an ar as artists, as writers, or academics, or there's, there's a, a series of labels that we are not allowed to enter as such, but as musicians we can enter as such. But music itself enters spaces indeed and occupies spaces. If you go to certain spaces or hotels, you can hear music of black people constantly and you don't see any black person inside besides the ones that are in the kitchen uh, cleaning the dishes. And this is how music has this power of occupying spaces and I wanted to play with that. Um, also has this power and tradition of, I wanted to use music as a form of narrative, which is also a part of this African tradition of storytelling that you have um, you, you narrate something through the music and you understand even though you don't know what story I'm telling but you understand what is being said somehow and I find that very fascinating. So um, in this project I wanted to play with the silence and with the storytelling and with the other one I wanted to tell a story 
narrated through music and to play with this subvertive, to experiment with all these subvertive practices, to subvert uh, common artistic practices somehow. Yeah, one other layer of subverting is also the use of dominant sort of narratives from uh, Greek mythology, Narcissus and Echo, and then kind of subverted into, um, uh, yeah, in a knowledge that is decolonial, which I find this transition very interesting. So they are presented as metaphors for a colonial past uh, and as a politics of representation that only reflects themselves. Um, but at the same time, yeah, the you're speaking about racism through dominant narratives that we have been fed because we think our civilization is the best civilization based on Greek civilization, which I find this subversion um, also very interesting. And I was just wondering um, how, yeah, how do you relate to um, subverting existing knowledges or is that a common practice or do you feel that this is some part of, of your practice and then mostly you're using um, oral traditions, oral African traditions or other artistic strategies? What is the, what are you trying to grapple with here? Um, I don't know really. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer. I don't want, I'm not trying anything. I'm just doing what I like to do. <laughs> That's all. Um, actually, I, I think I do what is I'm busy with. Uh, for instance, to this project, Illusions, I was very busy with. I wanted to, I think in each project, like all of us, I think we are always doing the same thing. But we go on circles and it becomes more um, finer and finer, the question. Or, or, or maybe it's like questions that I have and that I want to understand who I am, knowing that as a black woman there's a lot of things that I do not know. There's a lot of things from my history that were hidden that were not published, that were not documented. A lot of names of a lot of people that I would have liked to have known and I do not know. A lot of books that I would like to have in my library where as a child or as a teenager or as a student I would have liked to have and I couldn't. Um, there's all this fragmentation um, in my everyday life that I urge to complete. So I think from project to project, um, you have this question that you are concerned with, and then it's like you put all these pieces together and you start, you, and you start turning the pieces to do the puzzle, and you start putting them together, and you complete this puzzle, and this question is for you, now answer it. And it's like a process, a very spiritual process, I think, of... Um, of completing things, of putting things in place, of naming them, and do a proper burial to the ghosts, so that they're not ghosts anymore. That's this process, which I think it's very spiritual when we work with one topic. And even in an installation, and you, we name things properly, and we put things in their place, knowing that big part of our history have not had a dignifying burial or a dignifying ritual or were properly named and documented. So I think it's part of that process. And, um, and I, I think this is, this is um, for instance, with illusions I had very much, how do I work with this? Um, I, I, I was very struck with this sentence by Franz Fanon, all this whiteness that burns me. And that was always there. And I was thinking, how do I create this project that can exactly bring that into life? Or how can I m make it visible that without us no realizing, we have create this normativity and this normality um, that is not normal at all. And how to dismantle that? And, and I thought, 
Well, it, it is it is Narcissus. Uh, it is Narcissus and the echoes. Uh, Donald Trump, on the day I did the f performance, I had the premiere of Illusions at the Biennale of Sao Paulo. I was there with Gabby Noble, who was my curator. And we were there, and uh, on that day, uh, Donald Trump was elected. And then we were reading that 53% of the voters of Donald Trump were white women, the echoes. And we were, aware, yeah? And, and we were talking about that, about uh, the, the force of mythology to transport this mythology into today's um, politics and, and um, yeah. How long is that? Ten minutes. Oh, okay. We can have one more question. <laughs> Which one shall I choose? <laughs> the one you like most. Uh, okay. <laughs> So yeah, I um, thank you for your um, uh, yeah extensive explanation about yeah your process and also how you came to this work and all the layers of the work. Um, it's it's a good work to just keep thinking about as you leave the space and can yeah yeah. Um, I. I also wanted to um, talk about your curating practice because you have also curated a series called Cosmos. Cosmos. I wouldn't call myself a curator. You did, uh, okay. But, yeah. um, <laughs> but you, yeah. yeah. Mm. The Cosmos, yes. Yeah. Would you like to tell more about what happened there? Um, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cosmos was. I won't call myself a curator. I think I was luckily invited by Shermin Langoff, who was the director of the Maxim Theater in Berlin, which is one of the most important and imp fascinating theaters uh, in Germany, I would say in Europe, really rev making a revolution in arts and in Prices. Winning prizes every year with the best pieces and the best work, also because she's very political. I think Shermin is also the first woman of color. She's a Turkish uh, woman directing such a national, big national theater, which means a lot. And really transformed, had the courage. I think a little bit the process that you have are uh, having here with many difficulties to transform spaces. And the Maxim Gorky Theatre were back then called the Zing Academy two centuries ago. And Alexander von Humboldt, the great uh, Wissenschaftler, the great scientist, um, did, as it was common back then, um, several colonial journeys to Central America especially to Cuba and so on, to study, to define, to classify, to name, to, to document um, the cosmos. And as it was common back then, many, the knowledge production was financed by uh, the Spanish um, royalty um, who would pay these people to go to study, to create knowledge, because they had huge interest or having a new topography, new geographies, new maps, detailed information of the places they want to exploit and they want to colonize further, deeper, harder. And um, so um, it's also this question who receives scholarships, who receives fellowships, who receives commissions to create which, which knowledge that with which political interests. So he went, he did his journeys and he came back and he, I think he was treated like a pop star or something back then. And he did these incredible lectures that were called Cosmos at, uh, at um, Zing Academy, which is today the Maxim Gorky Theater. So uh, we face this question, 
what do we do with an historical space that has this colonial legacy? How do we occupy or rename, how do we interrupt spaces and appropriate spaces and transform spaces? Ring, 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 Sherman called me. It was 2015 and as you, you know, 2015 during the summer, many people were crossing Europe from the Middle East, in particular from Syria and arriving, physically arriving in Berlin, in Germany. It was physical, it was not something that you read in the news or, or so, it, people were arriving there. Uh, we have to do something. Um, how, what should we do? And there were many things that we were doing and then came this idea uh, of uh, doing a new cosmos, a cosmos square. Um, and uh, Sherman called, how oh, you have to do it. Uh, you have, oh, I'm, uh, uh, what should we do? And uh, we put something together. I loved working on that. And I wanted to do a concept called, or I wanted to do no ID that ends a two years series of artist talks where the intention was to occupy the space and to transform that space and to remember the history of that space and to transform it by changing the configurations of power and knowledge. So to say, we can only create new knowledge, new concepts of knowledge if we change the configurations of power. That means people usually do not have entrance to these spaces enter. And if we change these configurations of power, who can sit here with a microphone and who can be here, can deliver knowledge and questions and concepts, the new formats that were not there before because these people are not here. Um, I enter this space, I, I, I've met many people working here. I didn't see any black person working here. You, you were the first woman of color that I saw working here. I'm Me, not, myself. I'm not working here. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We do not work here. <laughs> exactly. So um, how can we build a curriculum or an agenda mm. if we are not here? Mm. If we're not defining what should be here? And if we're not bringing questions that are not, cannot be posed here? And that how can we bring methodologies if we are not here? How can we bring new paradigmas if we are not here? You can only bring new questions if we are here to ask these questions. And questions that might not be relevant for most of the people who have the privilege of always being here. We can only bring new methodo methodologies, that means new formats of working, mm. new formats. Mm. If we are here and say, I don't work with this format, I'm going to revert that. I'm going to use something else. I'm going, I have another idea. And we can only bring new paradigmas, that means new perspectives, how to approach those questions if we are here. So what I'm talking about is epistemology, means the epistem, logos, the acquisition of knowledge, logos, knowledge, epistem, acquisition. That means how do, how do we acquire, how do we produce knowledge is through the questions, the methodologies and the paradigms. Um, and this is only possible when we change the configurations of power. That means people usually are outside these spaces, have to be inside the spaces to produce knowledge that have never been produced before. And this is how we decolonize. So we thought, I thought this is exactly what I want to do. And I want to bring artists that have just arrived or are here for a while, but who have the status of refugees or had but they come to talk about their work and all the mythologies and questions and techniques that they use and not as the refugees themselves. 
and there's no Q and A because people should listen to, and that was very challenging for the audience because they're very curious and they're very um, familiar to ask questions. And the concept that I want created was that people should come to listen to them, and they're not going to tell how many boats they took and how many hours it took or so but they're going to talk about their work. And, and it was very fascinating because suddenly you reverted the, 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 the gaze that it was challenging but very inspiring to realize that some of the people who, have, who are here, they are here because they did that film or they, and they went to prison because of that film that they, uh, they did or because of the music or because of the choreography. They were all different artists from different disciplines. And it was quite fascinating that many of them were there uh, or were here exactly because of the art they produced and the knowledge that they produced. And it was, uh, I think, challenging for the audience but very inspiring to listen to them without this voyeurism. Now I want to hear the private story, how, how it goes. As we know, when we give an interview and everybody wants to know where we come from, but where are we from, when did we arrive, where do we like to be? And I always interrupt, I want to talk about my work. And you cannot talk about your work because it's so focused on the voyeurism. And we wanted exactly to break that down. And it was beautiful. It's um, you know what it was? It was always packed, overpacked. People were sitting everywhere on the floor, two years long. And that just shows us all that the uh, audience is much more avant-garde, it's much more futuristic than the institutions themselves. I think when the institutions are there to change their curriculum, there's a huge audience more than ready to, to come. It's really lovely. Um, like today, but it's really lovely. It's always my experience. People are really there looking forward. It is the institutions themselves that are fixated in this very old curriculum and agenda that actually does not speak to most of the audience. Um, and that sometimes, as we know in contemporary art, is very detached detached from the reality and from the political reality. This many times are works you pass by, but it does, you know, physically you not even stop because it's detached from your reality. So it was beautiful to do that. And for that, you of course, you need a woman with courage and or several women or several people uh, who say, um, we have to do it, I want to do it, it's our responsibility to do it, and we did it, and then we did it again and again and again because it was so successful, yeah. and we just stopped it uh, last month. For I said, no, I want to do my things, uh, and but it was very beautiful, uh, and it was a conversation mostly um, between me and two artists. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I watched um, three or four of them. They're all available on YouTube for the audience if you want to watch it. Yeah. Uh, documented, yeah. All documented. Very, uh, very, very lovely to s to watch and to see we the different to artists. To it, it is. They're beautiful. Yeah. And we wanted now to uh, transcribe and, and create a, f a book um, and publish the conversations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> very inspiring. We should have something like this structurally in the Netherlands. So this is a one, like a six week event, but this cosmos was over a period of two years. And of course, the every uh, month. yeah, every month. And the Maxim Gorky Theater is doing a very inspirational job. And I think we have to also push um, towards those directions also in the Netherlands. Yeah, and with, um, yeah, on this note, I also, um, wanted to open up to the public, uh, unless you wanted to uh, add something else. Are there any questions from the public? No? <laughs> Are we shy today? <laughs> yeah, in the front. 
Um, I was wondering, um, well, you were saying that you're exploring through these different pieces, but for example, with this piece, I haven't seen the other pieces, but with this piece, your presence or your voice is very, very important. Um, have you thought of this piece, for example, having it um, maybe dead <laughs> in a museum with your voice? So not yourself, but uh, with your voice. That would be the first question. The second question related to the piece is, do you perform it also in other languages? Because I assume you speak Portuguese and uh, maybe French or German to reach other communities and make us aware of the white cube. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, if I would reduce this film into a voiceover, then it would not be a performance, it would be a film. Uh, I'm not interested in doing that. Um, it would contradict for me a little bit the concept. Not because it's not beautiful to do a film, but I'm not interested. I wanted to do a storytelling, and storytelling needs a woman. It's something very matriarchal. It's a woman sitting in front of you. you, you we need to create an arc, and you have to sit and listen it has to create this suspense. So I didn't want it to, that's why I decided to have the film silent. I wanted the film to be like a visualization, like a dream of something you hear, but there's a person, a physical person telling. So that's why, um, for the first answer, we are now, we were shooting yes, uh, the, yesterday, the, the last two, uh, two days, before I came here, um, the second part of the storytelling, because we are creating a two-channel installation to present in, in soon, to install soon, so uh, with a large and then a vertical storyteller. So I'm there without being there, and to create a, like a small theater where people sit. But um, it didn't occur to me that I could just give the voice over to the film. I really wanted to have these two elements of the storyteller, of this woman who's a kind of contemporary griot and tells a story, and then explains to the audience why she's telling that story, and the visualization and this dream that you have the possibility to look at one or the other. And I think this is um, a mixture of performance, storytelling, theater, film, whatever. And I like that mixture, that's, that's why. About the language, oh, <laughs> this is a difficult, you know, everybody wants me to speak in a, in a language. I go to Brazil and everybody wants me to do it in Portuguese <laughs> and, um, and, uh, I cannot, and I don't want, and I think it's also okay. Um, anyway, we all speak in colonial languages. Uh, I remember being in Brazil, uh, showing it, and people are so wonderful there. It's a great audience. And then um, at the end, people came and said, but you have to do it in Portuguese. It's the most beautiful language. <laughs> And that annoys me profoundly, me, uh, profoundly. And I say, well, it's not the most beautiful language. It's just another colonial language. No, but Portuguese is not English. English is imperialist. And then it was very, very beautiful. And I said, well, all the European languages are colonial languages, including Spanish and Portuguese and, and Dutch and everything. For me, the difference is that through English, um, I left Lisbon to study, uh, to do a PhD in Berlin and so on, and English was for me the language of post-colonial studies, the, lang uh, the language of gender studies, the language of queer studies, of transgender studies. For me, it was always the language of, um, of transformation. It was the language of... Uh, Tony Morrison, of the Black Panthers, of Paul Giroy, of Stuart Hall, and so on. So um, there's a transformative, a, a certain the colonial exercise in the English language that we do not have in Portuguese. I was just telling you that 
that to Sao Paulo I tried to translate into Portuguese and I had serious difficulties when I came to certain terms, probably like in Dutch. And I know I cannot say that. I just cannot, I have to think to reimagine language anew because this process of decolonization didn't take place in most of European languages. Um, the she and the he, oh, it's so complicated. And then you want to put the X, but it doesn't exist. And uh, there's a, it's, it's very complicated to, to, it's very complicated. I will, I'm not there yet. But above all, I'm not there into idealizing or romanticizing languages. I'm not interested in doing that. I, s I write in the language that comes to me. And at the moment, the language that comes to me, with all mistakes or not, it's English, because it's the language that with which it's possible for me to do the work that I do. I cannot do it in Portuguese or in German. German is the language where I am an immigrant. Uh, Portuguese is the language, uh, my mother language, um, that is so fucking problematic that I, I had to, to go away uh, to, to find it. So uh, we all live in this moment of transformation where we're questioning a lot of things and um, we are this generation post-colonialism so there's a lot of things in terms of race, gender, sexuality that we're constantly questioning and we are reinventing those languages so I'm not into glorifying any of them but I use English as a language that taught me to speak like this because of the so many books I wrote, uh, I wrote, I, I read, and m thousand times, and that were written in English, and that most of the authors, then it's a, like a common language that in Europe becomes very privileged. I think if you go to a country like Brazil, then it's very sad because you want to reach the communities, and most of them do not really speak English. And it's very sad, you really see, you know, it's these young, lovely, great looking, cool people with high phones and then they don't speak a word of English. And you see how problematic and colonial the system still is. So um, uh, the second time I presented in Brazil, it was in Salvador, I translated everything and I presented in Portuguese because it was very important for, and it was beautiful and the audience really deserves the language of Angola. It doesn't mean nothing of that. So we have so, such serious problems to narrate, and that's why I find very fascinating that we do all these works and experiment at all these different levels, including language. Yeah. Another question. <coughs> uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Mitchell. I'm from New Urban Collective and uh, the Black Archives. We have a small exhibition uh, at the other side of the space. Which is beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for your uh, performance. It was very inspiring. Um, you talked about um, you know, the African tradition of storytelling. And uh, that is also one of the main goals of the Black Archives to you know, bring back uh, stories that have, been, that have been suppressed or that have been erased and hidden. Um, so my question is, you know, what is the, uh, if you can elaborate on the difference between the tradition of African storytelling with other forms of knowledge production and how it can be used to, you know, transform things. Um, can, you, can you repeat again your question? Yeah, uh, so if you can you elaborate on uh, the difference between um, the tradition of African, you know, of storytelling with um, yeah, the difference between that with you know the Eurocentric forms of knowledge production. Yeah, I think I understood now, thank you. You know, um, I w I, I'm very in love, I must say. I, I find it very complex. I didn't understand yet, because I think it's so complex and so big, what the role of a griot is. And the griot um, in West Africa is someone who is uh, not only the storyteller, but the storytelling is very complex. Is someone who tells what happened 
who makes an analysis of what happened, brings the news, um, mm, analyzes it, um, and, and, and creates a narrative about something that happened, um, using the voice in a rhythmic way. It's a special tone of voice to speak. It's rhythmic. It's accompanied with instruments. Um, the storytelling, the, br the production of knowledge um, is surrounded by music and by musicians. It has um, this physicality but it also has all this spirituality, all these rituals of arriving, asking for permission, knowing who we are speaking about uh, from ancestors, the present and the future. I, f I find this very um, important, this uh, past, present and future. And I find that very fascinating. As we know, Griots then became this um, this, this tradition uh, became part of the modern era um, through slavery, um, enslaved Africans and enslaved griots were brought to the Americas. Um, and these became um, performative in spoken word, in rap, in hip hop, which are more than um, modern forms of the griot, the storyteller. The rapper comes and tells a story. I'm gonna tell you what happened today. I saw that and this is a griot. This is exactly the exercise of a griot. I arrive to tell you what happened. I move my body. I, there's dance, choreography, physicality. There's, um, there's music, there's instruments that come with me, there's people who come and go and make part of this narrative. So all these is present then in rap, in hip hop, in spoken word, and jazz as well, in many, f in the blues, um, is the storyteller telling, uh, and is about producing knowledge, producing narratives, telling something, something that I saw, something I came here to tell you something, I've been thinking about this, and there's an all analysis of it, and this is knowledge production. And this is very present in the African diasporic arts, as you know, and mostly in music, because of the reasons I told you before, because we can be athletes and musicians, but we cannot be artists and writers. Um, so most of the times during the colonial time, we are reduced to physicality, to the physique. Fanon speaks about that quite well, that it is the mirror stage of the white society. The white subject is the subject and we are the body and we are reduced to the body. We can be the, the, the athletes and, um, and the singers and, and the dancers, but we cannot be the intellectuals, we cannot be the engineers, the architects, and so on, and the intellectuals. So there's all these, um, yeah, these dimensions. I don't know if I answered your question, did I? Yeah, yeah great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll stand up, otherwise I can't see you. Hello. Hello. Thank you for your uh, performance. It was really inspiring and uh, yeah, I recognize myself in it, so it's really nice. Thank you. Um, just one question um, in line of all your, all your work and what you're doing. What's your vision for society? Oh. <laughs> Tiny question. Is that a <laughs> It's a short sentence. Like <laughs> My vision. I don't know. It's, it, oh my God. <laughs> A vision. Well, I don't know. I think this. I avoid to answer these big questions. What's my vision? How do we end racism? And uh, these big recipes. Um, because I think um, this has nothing to do with moralism. 
It's a political position. It's about positioning ourselves. So uh, when we talk, for instance, about racism, it's nothing more realistic. It's not nothing about being a good person or a bad person. It's not about the question, am I racist or not? Or it's about taking position ourselves anew constantly and see ourselves as you human beings who are in constant, in a fascinating, constant process of changing. That means it is about political decisions and it is about responsibility. And if you are talking specifically about racism, it's not about moral, it's about responsibility, that people have the responsibility to um, position themselves. Um, it's about taking decisions. It's about saying, in this institution, I do not want to carry the name of someone who committed colonial crimes, crimes against humanity during the colonial time. I do not want to work or to be in a space that carries this name, Vit de Vit. It doesn't have to. This belongs to the past. I am now in the present. So I have to take the responsibility and to risk to be transformative. And this is what arts is about. It's about creating things that are able to transform. Um, it's, about, it's not about doing nice arts. That's why black people don't, uh, don't draw uh, flowers. We don't do films about flowers and so, because we have other issues to talk about which are linked with dehumanization, with glorification of a colonial past which was brutal, which was dehumanizing and that is being always named as if it was nothing. That's why we don't work about, our works are not about flowers and plants and birds. That's why. So um, back to what I wanted to say is that um, it is a question of responsibility and it is a question of um, ones, I think when you are on the top of an institution in a power position, you have this huge responsibility and also to ha you need to have this courage of risking, like an artist has the courage of risking and you shit in your pants, always afraid, not knowing if it's going to be good, but you risk. And I think when you risk, when you transgress the normativity, that's when your work is good, that's when you touch people. And, and that's exactly what also institutions have to do. Like the story I told before about the Gorky Theatre, that we say, well, we're just going to do it. Um, we're going to take exactly the problem into our hands and unfold it and use it as a moment of transformation. And I think that's nothing more fascinating than that. So what I wanted to say is that um, I see my vision is that it's not a single one. My vision is that I see myself in constant transformation. I think maybe that's why I, I've been walking these different fields and I, I, I love that. I find that very, very important to be open to change for something new and also to take responsibility when you know this is wrong or this does not speak to the present, this speaks to the past and I am in the present and I cannot interrupt my present with the past. I have to arrive today and in this sense we take this of 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 of, conclu of decisions, which I think is the vision um, of seeing yourself as a const as a being in constant transformation. It has also to become a better person, a more imperfect person. You always have to transform yourself. Yeah. Thank you. you what a Thank you. What a good note to end this uh, discussion with. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Grada. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Thank you. Thank you.